Real Stories Tapes True Crime is your new true crime podcast fix. In our first season, we'll explore suspicious deaths at a California hospital and a skydiver landing dead on a suburban driveway with a bag containing guns, drugs, and night vision goggles. To join our investigation, search and subscribe to Real Stories Tapes True Crime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. Imagine a conspiracy against you when there isn't one. According to psychiatrist R.D. Lang, there's no word for someone who is being conspired against and doesn't know it. She thought it was a dream. Even when she couldn't find her camera the next day, she didn't give it a second thought. which is why she never mentioned it to the next tenant who moved into the same apartment. A working student named Sue Levesque. So weeks later, when Sue Levesque is taking a shower and the shower curtain suddenly sucks in on her as if someone had opened the front door, she shrugs it off as just her imagination. Then her spare keys, which she always keeps on the stereo speaker, go missing. It's confusing because the chain lock was still on and the stick is still wedged in the balcony door. The super lives directly above her. When she goes home for Thanksgiving, she asks him to keep an eye on her place while she's away. When she returns, she's rattled that the super says he thought he heard someone in her apartment the day before. It wasn't her. Nothing is missing except the hockey stick normally wedged in the balcony door. She's tempted to call the police, but what would she say? Someone broke into my apartment and didn't take anything? Instead, she settles for the super making her a new stick. That night, she can't sleep trying to figure out what to do. The next morning, she puts a jar outside the door. If it's moved, she'll know someone was in her apartment. Then she sets off for work. Coming home that evening, she's spooked to find that the jar has been Then she notices the bathroom door is closed. Living alone, she never closes it. Someone is in there. Someone she doesn't know. And they're dead. Words spill out of her mouth about a dead body in her bathroom. He tells her the victim is a teenage girl who babysits the super's son. He calls 911. It seems only seconds before the police and the ambulance arrive. 
Sue hears the commotion. She hears someone shouting something about resuscitation. Then she hears the victim's mother. Then she hears the mother's anguished scream. The victim is a 15-year-old who lives in the next building. Her name is Carol Ann Jennings. It breaks your heart. After the emergency crews leave, the IDENT unit goes in. The first thing they do is collect short-lived evidence, any evidence that might be subject to changes in weather or might easily be contaminated. A soil sample just inside the door. A footprint on the balcony. And hairs and fibers. If we can see it, then we're going to collect it. And in other words, if we can see a hair or a fiber, then we're going to very carefully collect that. Hairs, fibers, footprints. These are all known as trace evidence. In this case, where there was no eyewitness, trace evidence was to be crucial. The IDENT unit will examine the footprints. The hairs and fibers will be sent to the forensics expert at the Center of Forensic Sciences. We deal with the hairs one by one. We have to deal with them as individual hairs and individual fibers. And we subject them, each of these individual fibers, to a battery of tests. It was lucky Jim Crocker was a patient man, because it would take months and months to examine and analyze all the trace evidence from this ugly murder. To further their investigation, police asked Sue Levesque to go through the apartment and tell them if she notices anything out of place. Of course, she tells them about the jar. That someone has rearranged her books, and that she's missing a bra. Meanwhile, the victim's body is sent to the autopsy. External examination of the body showed uh, a ligature mark across the uh, front of the neck, uh, and mainly to the right-hand side of the neck, but crossing the midline to the left in this particular case. The ligature uh, was a brassiere. In association with the ligature mark, there were multiple areas of abrasion, meaning scraping of the top layers of skin. And it's not unusual in cases such as this that the victim will uh, cause injury to the skin in an attempt to uh, get the hands or the ligature off the neck. This woman was conscious and was fighting for her life as she was being strangled. But what was she doing in Sue Levesque's apartment? Sue had found the chain lock just as she left it, and the stick still wedged perfectly in the sliding door. We pick up the story with the investigators. So we found out that this uh, the superintendent of the building is who she babysat for, and we learned that the apartment was totally secured, so we became very suspicious of him because he would probably have access to that apartment. And uh, we immediately responded to interview him and uh, in the upstairs apartment. But when the police questioned the superintendent, his alibi is that he was at work the whole time. About the same time, detectives hear from the victim's mother about a possible suspect in a nearby town who had once sexually abused her daughter. It turns out that both the super and the other suspect have ironclad alibis. So it throws everything back to the apartment. What was the victim doing in Sue Levesque's apartment? And how come both doors were still locked? The answer was to be found in these traces of paranoia. 
Exhibit A, hairs and fibers. Investigators question Sue Levesque again, this time about anything unusual that may have happened the day of the murder. She was just leaving for work when she saw a guy quickly turn away. It aroused her suspicions. She thought to herself, this is the guy who's been breaking into my apartment. She just convinced herself she was being ridiculous when she drove past his car a moment later and noticed it was empty. That's why she memorized the license plate number. Police traced the car to a Barney Lomage. Lomage lives in the basement flat at his mother's. When police question him, he flatly denies his car has been in front of the victim's building at any time during the day. They were gone for approximately 20 minutes. We then asked, was it a white MGB? And they said, yes. Is it the right license number? Yes. We said, could you go back and uh, set up surveillance on him? We wanted to keep track of him. We wanted to know what his whereabouts were at all times. We wanted to see where he was going to lead us to. Um, we knew nothing about Barney Lamage other than the information that Sulevac had given us. Police hustled back just in time to catch Lomage doing something suspicious. I went to the manhole, looked down it with my flashlight, and I could see a knife lying in the bottom. The manhole cover was removed. I climbed down inside, photographed it, and collected the knife from the uh, sewer. The curious thing about this particular knife is that it's a bread and butter knife. So uh, when we collected it, um, we really didn't know what it was, uh, how it was connected to the scene at that particular time. Why was he ditching a butter knife? The victim hadn't been stabbed. The ident unit was baffled. Meanwhile, detectives get a break. We then went back in and commenced interviewing the superintendent again. And I can recall saying to him, by the way, do you know Barney Lamage? And he said, no, I don't. And then he thought for a minute, and he said, Barney, just a minute. And he went out to, I believe, his kitchen area, and he got his record book. And he says, yeah, here he is right here, Barney Lamage. He used to live here. And we said, oh, that's interesting. Where did he live? And he said, in the apartment where the murder occurred. When questioned by police, Lomash swears he spent the day filling out applications at an employment office 30 kilometers away. He gives officers the name of the woman he dealt with. Police drive the route five totally different ways to see if it's possible to fill out the application and still have time to commit the murder. It is. So all these pieces were fitting together. Barney Lomage is now their strongest suspect. Police scrutinize his every move. And now he's going into a bush riding with two other young females on horses. So we kept close surveillance as close as we could on them. We were concerned that, oh, we're going to be in trouble if they don't come out of that bush all intact. As soon as he came out of that uh, stable, he got in his car and left. He went a very short distance down the road, and we asked our surveillance team to do a rolling stop with him. Bob and I approached the car, and he was immediately arrested for first-degree murder. But when detectives meet with the chief prosecutor, He's concerned that their evidence on Barney Lomage is woefully thin. Police get a search warrant to check out Lomage's apartment. They find silverware whose pattern matches the butter knife he dropped in the sewer and a roll of film. In situations like this, the police always hope it'll contain photos of the victim and implicate the suspect but the photos turn out to be from a party. None of the pictures show even a trace of Carol Ann Jennings, Sue Levesque, or Barney Lomage. When police interview the tenant who lived in the apartment before Sue Levesque, she recalls her strange dream and her missing camera. It turns out the photos from the camera in Lomage's room are one she took of a party she attended. Obviously, it hadn't been a dream. 
but that only proves he was in the apartment a year ago. Investigators needed to prove that Barney Lomage was with Carol Ann Jennings in Sue Levesque's apartment on the day of the murder. The very foundation of forensic science is based on a theory that every criminal will always take something away from the scene of a crime and leave something behind, even if it's only a trace. The, the fingerprints that were useful for us in this uh, investigation were the fingerprints of uh, our deceased on the textbooks that were in the bedroom. Investigators theorized that the victim must have seized the books as the only possible weapon to defend herself against her attacker. And uh, we also dusted a uh, part of the balcony at this residence, the front balcony, and found a footprint. Uh, and that footprint, of course, was useful because that was later identified as being made by the shoe of our accused. Police also obtained hair samples from Barney Lomage. What you see is one of the hairs from our accused, and this was found present on the bedclothes that were present. As you can see from the convoluted nature of the hair ending here, this is the root end. This is what we would term a ribbon root. And it indicates that the hair was in the active growth phase at the time it was pulled from the scalp. And in fact, it allows us to say that this was forcefully removed. But investigators still have a problem because a good defense lawyer could argue that Barney Lomage's hairs and footprints were found in the apartment because he used to live there. Trace evidence can be used by either side. Investigators need to find trace evidence connecting Barney Lomage, his apartment, his car, the victim, and Sue Levesque's apartment. In this case, the painstaking and arduous process is a two-way street. Some cases involve a considerable amount of interplay between ourselves and the investigators. Uh, we develop some evidence, uh, we relate what our findings to them, and they in turn uh, consider the meaning of this evidence and can it possibly lead to other findings with respect to fibers or hairs. As an example, in this case, we surfaced within the apartment where the murder occurred, we surfaced a number of red fibers. They were present on the bedclothes, they were present on the deceased, and yet within the apartment, there was no source for these uh, fibers. Investigators get another search warrant and obtain a number of articles from the accused bedroom. One of the articles is Barney Lomash's red dressing gown. Once we had established or mounted some of these fibers from the dressing gown and started comparing them with the fibers that appeared at the scene, we were able to say that, yes, they are the same. But forensic investigators have a saying, you can never have too much evidence. As the trial date approaches, Jim Crocker produces a chart with more than 150 samples that identify various kinds of trace evidence, hair, and numerous fibers from the murder scene, Lomage's car, and his apartment. Police surmise Barney had been stalking Carol Ann. From his car, he could track her movements as she came down from babysitting in the super's apartment to go back home. On the morning in question, he waited till Sue Levesque had left for work and broke into her apartment. He replaced the jar where he thought it had been. Then he waited just inside the door until he heard Carol Ann in the hall. He grabbed her and pulled her into the apartment. She struggled. He forced her into the bedroom where he tried to get her onto the bed. She tried to fight him off with whatever was nearby. She grabbed Sulevec's books.
Finally, he forced her into the bathroom and strangled her with the bra. Then he straightened the books and was going to straighten the rest of the apartment when he heard a siren. He quickly relocked the front door and gently let the stick fall back into place. Now we know how he got out. The question is how he got in. At the trial, Dennis Cullen demonstrated how he thought it was done. And then reach in and slide the chain up using the knife, and you're in. When the ident officer did it in court, the jury gasped. We had uh, a witness tell us that as a six-year-old, she, she was sexually assaulted by Lamage. As a six-year-old, this happened. So, I mean, his, you know, his uh, evilness went, went back that far. In the end, Barney Lomage was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. And here's a girl that was 15 years old. She lived a very short life. Uh, she was just an average teenager. If that doesn't motivate you to, to do your job well, then nothing will. And what about Sue Levesque, the young woman who had to wrestle with her own paranoia? She thought it unusual enough to write down the license number. Had she not done that, this case would have been much more difficult, if not unsolvable. She provided us with a ton of forensic evidence in this case because of the fact that she was able to point us in the right direction so quickly. And she was a witness of witnesses. She really was fantastic. Barney Lomage might have become a serial murderer, but he didn't, thanks to a great investigative team, a dream witness, and a crack forensic scientist who used a strand of fiber to give Barney enough rope to hang himself. The stories on Exhibit A are based on actual cases.